Um, I would say a properly set up wet sump system and um, well, take your pick of, I'll say, uh, oil uh, insertion systems, okay. if you will, yeah. to uh, go ahead and be a Band-Aid. So. Sure. Well, see, I think my opinion on it is that it's, I, I would, I would play devil's advocate there and say that it's more important for even like mid-tier Subaru race cars and up because of the reliability that it brings in terms of oil pressure but also because of the fact that the dry sumps eliminate, basically eliminate the PCV system. Mm -hmm. And and the PCV system like can be really problematic on the EJ platform, even if you have intervention methods, inter oil separation and so forth. And I, my sense, I guess, what is your take on this? My sense is that issues with the PCV system are more to blame for engine failures than in, than issues with the oil pressure system, like the oil pump system. I wouldn't blame the PCV. PCV specifically, crankcase ventilation. Okay, crankcase ventilation. So, so I yeah. would say if you uh, yes, no, it's in the same volume as your you know your oil system, your wet system. Right. But right. I would say oil slosh. I would blame it on the PCV system. Right. Okay. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. This show is brought to you by Flatiron's Tuning, your source for any aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts. Be sure to check out our store at flatironstuning.com, and stay tuned with Flatiron's Tuning. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, right. to Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. This is number episode number 100, and I think it's 105 now. And we've got a special guest with us back again. We have got Micah from 3MI Racing. Uh, you might look familiar if you've watched uh, the video that we did where we talked about a couple of years ago now, believe it or not, about Subaru long rod engines. And so, Micah, you, you kind of spearheaded 3MI racing. And since we first talked, like one of the things that's come out is like your oil return hose for the, the AOSs. So basically to mm -hmm. improve the function of those uh, AOS hose or air oil separators, which has been really interesting. Um, and it sounds like you got some more stuff in the works. Is that right? I do. A lot of them kind of got put on hold for last year, but yeah, yeah getting, getting them back up and going. Well, and and they got put on hold for last year because so three my racing. It's it's kind of it was it was your side gig, and now it's kind of becoming your your main job again. But you you were you had an interesting day job uh, for a little while there. So just yeah. for anybody that might not be uh, familiar, like what what were you doing to just to just pay the bills? Um. So the the title uh, was uh, performance design team leader at Red okay. Bull Powertrains. So Red Bull powertrains. Uh, they're the drinks maker, though, right? I mean, that seems strange. Yeah, yeah. F the fizzy drink company. Yeah, fizzy drink guys. company. Yeah. Yeah. That, that also happens to run a Formula One team. Yeah, yeah. Championship yeah. winning Formula One team, those guys. Yeah. Very cool. And and before that, even, you had a big role in designing or helping out with the engine that was in the 4GT when they went back to Le Mans and stuff like that. Or is that fair to say? Correct. Yeah, I was at okay. Roush Yates for a couple of years as well. Yeah. So you have a lot of experience with engines, and which is you know one of the reasons yeah. why we talked about the super long long red engines. But now you've got to like play with some some of like the the really pointy end of development on an engine. And I know that you can't go into a whole lot of detail about that, but I wanted to kind of just kind of talk to you first about like how that even works. How do you how do you even design an engine from from zero? Like where do you, how do you even know where to start? Uh, so usually. Well, uh, my experience, I'll say, might be a bit different from an OEM. Uh, OEMs usually have a balance of uh, both performance and emissions. It changes all kinds of stuff. Sure. Like you'll see people comparing the new, what the new, uh, was it, J35 or Honda just released, dual overhead cam with no VTEC. And everyone's like, oh, you yeah. know, my Pinto Star V6 made more power than that 15 years ago when it came out. Well, it's different. Emission, you know, emissions were totally different. Right. You know, if you looked at power per, you know, gram of CO2 that comes out, it's going to be totally different, right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, emissions per you know, 100 kilometers should take your unit of measurement. Um, so they've got a different rule set. In, in racing, for instance, Formula One, we obviously have a very strict rule set in which the mm -hmm. FIA came out and said, essentially, here's your bore size. Here's your valve size plus or minus one mil. You know, here's, you know, the angle that they can be at, you know, within this given window. Injector has to be placed between here. Like a lot of the things are very confined. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of already have a given set of rules. And being it's a 1.6 liter V6, you've got 260 cc's roughly to work with. So that then defines your stroke as well. And so you kind of already painted into a, a pretty bit of a box in that regard. 
right? Yeah. Um, it's not as wide open as say an OEM where you've got someone like Porsche is still making like 103 millimeter bore flat sixes. And meanwhile, yeah. you got Volkswagen with an 81 millimeter bore inline five. Like they both meet the same emissions regs, but you know, totally different sides of it. So right. yeah, that, that's, that's a bit of a different picture there. They don't have a specific rule set that they're following other than just emissions and make power to keep customers happy. Sure. And then, so once you, once you kind of like it, I'm guessing there's there's various engineering principles that kind of like give you like you already have a framework that you're working within and then you kind of decide like okay well this is the relationship between you know, like the piston that we know like if the bore is set I know that this is the bore here's the rod length mm -hmm. here's what we can do with the crank maybe maybe some thoughts about how that relates to what you can do with the valve train do you kind of from that base information kind of put together a package at that point or where you think the starting point would be so yeah you you'll kind of paint out you're, you're given well, let's see. So uh, we'll use a modern F1 engine, for instance, right? Uh, 2026 rules, there's no MGUH. Um, so that would be the uh, electric assisted turbo. Mm -hmm. um, they've killed that because it was quite cost. Uh, I'll just say it was quite costly in the Formula One world. Yeah. Um, I, I find it funny they killed it now that everybody finally kind of has it working well and consistently reliable, short of, you know, the, the prancing ponies in Italy. They've gone through a few. Yeah. Of them and if I recall, I think Garrett actually makes their turbos. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyhow, um, so we'll say you start there, right? You, you've got an 80 millimeter bore. Everybody has an 80 millimeter bore. You all have the same stroke, you know, same displacement. Uh, you, you know, you have a given, in their case, a max. Uh, we'll use, actually, I'll use current regs for fun. Uh, wow. Current regs. If I recall, it's 18 or 18 and a half to one compression ratio. That's what okay. you're allowed to have. Uh, I think it's a max of seven bar. So maybe it's okay. eight bar, something sky high right now. Um, it wasn't the rule set I was focusing on. Uh, okay. So, Big numbers, and then they also have a max octane of 102 research octane number. Uh, differentiate that's not the same as we get in the pump here, where right. it's you know research and octane. We take the average, that's why it's ron plus mon divided by two. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do that. Most of the rest of the world all uses research octane, which is uh, usually a bit higher number than motor octane just due to how it's tested. Um, but so you all kind of have these same rules. And so what you mm -hmm. really do is you start at the center, you work the inside out. So you take all your critical surfaces. So that'll be your combustion system, very, very critical. Uh, so you'll take from, you know, both your crown and your dish that really forms your combustion chamber. Mm -hmm. um, also in Formula One, you'd have your pre-chamber, which is a very, very critical part for them. That's what allows them to run so lean, but we can get right. to that later if we want. Sure. I'm not familiar. You know, not sure how familiar everybody is with what they do. Right. Um, and then also then the other major part of that is your ports. Uh, intake ports, super critical for how the air enters your chamber. It affects how the air interacts with the fuel that is injected into the chamber because they're direct injection. Um, also for port injection, carbureted, whatever it matters, because where that's going and where it's kicking is also where your fuel is going in those cases. So if you start getting forces, you know, vortices, things that are kicking, it'll separate sling fuel to you have rich yeah. pockets in different parts of the chamber. So how that works is also very important. And then, of course, the exhaust, you've got to get it out. Mm -hmm. um, and then your your interaction between the two, your overlap regions where both, you know, exhaust right. is closing and it takes valve, valve, yeah. yeah. And so you, you um, kind of you put all that together. Do you, do you model that? I'm guessing you would model that. Yeah. Yeah. They let it gets all modeled as, as surfaces. Uh, it goes through a lot and a lot, a lot, a lot of simulation work. Um, in our okay. case, the injectors also went through a massive amount of, uh, uh, I'll say simulation work as well. Mm -hmm. Um, different spray patterns, uh, different injection times, different, you know, injection pressures, uh, all kinds of things. Cause you have a, a range of pressures you can use as well. Um, of course, the more pressure you want to put on it, the more power that takes from your crank. So it's these things you start looking, everybody's got the same amount of, you know, the same slice of pie to work with. How do you best right. optimize what you have? Um, so you, you start at the inside and you work out. So if you want to think of it in very simple terms, you essentially define those critical geometries, literally just surface models. It's not a CAD model with bulky stuff. It's literally just surfaces. Okay. And then you wrap that in, and you wrap that in metal. Okay. That's how you make the engine. For, for the simulation. No, no. Simulation is no. just the surfaces. Oh, it's, it's just, just the surfaces. Okay, I see. Once you're happy with what you found and you want to go forward and make it a real thing and do, you know, then your you first head or your, okay. or your first piston, you know, or your first series that you're going to test, you, you go ahead and release them and turn them into finished parts. But for all the simulation work, it's literally, literally just the surfaces. Got it. Okay. And then, so that gets you close. Then you decide, okay, I, I like this design. Now we're going to physically try it. How critical of a step is making a physical model to actually run? Is it like has the has the simulation gotten good enough to the point where 
you can be like, say, 75, 80% sure that you're in the right path? Or is it something where you really need to physically build the thing and actually see what <clears throat> actually happens in the real world before you know that you're, you're onto something? It, it all depends on what you have for input. So simulation general, uh, particularly as you start getting into combustion sim and things like that, it's not just CFD. Uh, I say just CFD. That's, that's kind of probably diluting it too simply. Um, not to offend any CFD engineers out there. Um, yeah. You have so many parameters that go into it and boundary conditions um, that, that go into making sure that your model's accurate. That's the real thing. Uh, okay. So I can say for ours, our simulation performance group, um, they did a knockout job. Like we were spot on, like wow. within within a few kilowatt. Okay. Uh, actually, if anything, they might have sandbagged a little, but you know, I, I won't say where we landed initially. Sure, but, sure. So th things are running great. That guys did great work. Um, not saying a number, obviously. No, no. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I'm what I've seen and what I and what I've kind of heard mentioned. Uh, there's some videos that have come out now about like some test engines or uh, that were maybe like over 10, 15 years old, like the Cosworth had done, where it's like they built a single cylinder, single piston model of the engine and that's where they initially started testing right so so like you you, you do all the simulation so, but then when you're going to actually physically test it they started with just just one so uh, one it, cylinder if cost weren't a factor you would never bother with the single okay. um so so cost is a factor and the fia mandates that we have to use that well, okay we have to i don't we they have to <laughs> no no sure sure, sure sure but uh, that, you know that was what was required you're required to use a single cylinder um you don't have to you could choose oh, okay. not to use a single and have very, very limited V6 hours. Um, but that doesn't okay. make sense because you have a lot of work and a lot of analysis you can do on a single. Sure. Uh, part of the problem you do run into uh, with a single is uh, resonances. Um, it does not act like a V6. Um, right. Even if you want to simplify it, think about it. Each bank is an inline three, right? Mm -hmm. So you have three different exhaust pulses that are all hitting. And when they hit and what happens on scavenging actually plays a massive effect. I know a lot of guys are like, oh, it's turbo, you know, you know, exhaust tuning doesn't right. matter. It just is pressure and just put more pressure in. I mean, yes, if you don't have anything that you have to work to and don't have any kind of cap, then yeah, it doesn't really matter. Just, you know, run, you know, a million octane fuel and, you know, the biggest intercooler you can and all the boost right. you can get away with. And yeah, it's, it becomes one of those, but. Well, in seeing this, in seeing this, old, you know, Cosworth single cylinder engine, what, what I kind of made me wonder about is, you know, it would seem like maybe the majority of the design, like the, the most critical elements would be kind of as you would expect, you know, the, the bore, the rod length, the crank, the valves, mm -hmm. but then you have, you know, the intake manifold cooling and the exhaust well. manifold. Cooling. Well, cooling system too. Yeah. Sure. Well, but it, you know, how, how much detail do you put into like the runners that go into the cylinder or is it like when you're, when you're, kind of starting with the test, are you just worried about just getting air in and air out or are you no, really no, concerned the, also the geometries, modeling? No, the geometries you put into it are uh, in a simplified world, what, what you put in that one cylinder then would get handed off, to, in my case, would get handed off to the V6 team, the okay. mechanized team, and they would take it and multiply it by six and turn it into a V6. Now, the other thing that's nice about a single is certain things you don't have to worry about um, because the cell supplies it. So oil and scavenging, Water right. pump, things like that, you don't have to worry about because you don't want to have to worry about that detail every time you're trying to design another right. engine, another something. You're happy to go and say, hey, set water pressure at this and flow rate at that. And we you know, want temperatures to be here and want oil pressures and oil temperatures here and scavenging. Let's put this much vacuum on the crankcase. So you don't have to worry about actually mechanically swapping parts. Uh, you just tell the dyno to give you the result you want. So you kind of know what your target is. And so you just simulate the target versus actually having to really create right. that in an actual the, environment. Right. And, and so for instance, uh, we'll just use a simple one. So say you're, you know, try some scavenging, right? You're trying to pull super duper hard. You're trying to pull down to, you know, one atmosphere. Uh -huh. um, and, and you realize that in the end, you're actually having more pumping losses trying to pull that really deep vacuum. And if you went ahead and said, hey, we're happy at uh, three quarters of an atmosphere, you know, what we're right. on point, point seven five. Um, yeah. you know, 0.75, we found that, you know, we, we had actually more performance benefit because we weren't taking as much crank energy to go ahead and drive the dry sump. And we right. didn't have any more potential power gains, which is why you pull such vacuum on the crankcase anyway, to get windage out. And yeah. so you'd find that real quick in the dyno by just doing a sweep. And you go ahead okay. and say, crankcase, vacuum pressure, let's hit it here and move it to these points and take, you know, take measurements and see where we're sitting. And you go, cool. Now we actually have a target to give to the six group. 
that they actually will build into their dry sump stage. Gotcha. Because you you know in the beta test you have you have a, a pump that's sitting outside that's not actually on the engine. You can just make the vacuum whatever you want it to be. So you can find yep. out like, okay, well, where's the sweet spot? Where's the maximum benefit? And then where does like the gains not yep. not make sense for, for all this extra energy it's going to take to pull a deeper vacuum? Right. Is it the same kind of thing for for the intake charge? Like if, if you have boost pressure, can you can you test like, okay, like if we can make really high boost pressure, like do we get any benefit there or is, is there – right. Optimize Same. that. Yeah, so so boost pressure, uh, also exhaust back pressure, all of them. So you simulate having the turbine housing, whatever pressure you'll have okay. from the turbine housing or turbine housing. Um, and likewise, you you know, whatever you're going to have for your forced air comes from the dyno. So in a lot of ways, so, not having everything physically built allows you to simulate to figure out where you need to target when you actually do physically build the things. Gives you a lot of flexibility to test. We'll put it that gotcha. Way. Yeah. Well, and then, because you had mentioned, I think maybe when we had, had – kind of talked about having this conversation that the process at Roush Yates when you're working on the six cylinder for the four GT was different. Like, Correct. cause then that, that's where you, I guess maybe talk about some of those differences and maybe how that process w- worked. Um, so the four GT was honestly, I'll say a really light, relatively speaking project. Um, it's an existing engine. You had what you had. It's also going GT racing. So it's BOP. So mm-hmm. if you make a lot of power, they just take it away from you. If you find a lot of efficiency, they just, you know, take it away. Put on a smaller fuel restrictor or reduce your fuel tank because you mm-hmm. found fuel efficiency. It's it, it's it really, really stinks. BOP BOP sucks. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so in that regard, it was building an engine that would be reliable. Essentially, it's like you know, what what you and I do. It's performance mm-hmm. aftermarket in that regard. If you want to think of it that way, we're taking this. In that case, it was a EcoBoost. It was a model year fourteen. Ford Taurus SHO based engine, wow. um, you know, cleaning up ports, putting in necessary valve seats and billet cams and, you know, your usual bells and whistles, call up Pankle and have them, you know, go through the bottom end with you and make okay. something that'll go ahead and run for 24 hours. So it's and taking something you've... that already exists and just optimizing it. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Okay. Yeah. R- r- you know, building it to actually be a race application. Right. So, so, so maybe like, towards the end, similar considerations as far as reliability and, and options, but it's just, you, you have more of an existing framework that you're really working within for the, the whole engine. Whereas, Which can also be a hindrance too. Yeah. So yeah. If you end up finding you have a real problem, say for instance, um, hypothetical one, say, say you had a problem with Hertzstein stresses on uh, the camshafts. Mm-hmm. You're kind of boxed in with what comes in the head. Like right now you're going to start doing extra work to an existing head. Now you have to go ahead and, you know, do an entire, bore up on the cams to go to a larger cam diameter because you have your defined you're boxed on your width so you can't right. add any more bearing width to it um so it becomes one of those just real real simple example but you, you go all right well I, you, well we might have to find a more clever solution around this because right. we can't just simply change the head so in both cases potentially in both cases you have kind of a defined box or defined rule set and you're just you're trying to find ways to work within that within that from opposite definition. into the spectrum yeah. yeah. Well, once the box is painting you in, the other from the inside, you're, you're boxed in the painting outward, you know. Right, right. And just because I'm curious, like, and, and you kind of alluded to it, but maybe just to bring more of a focus to it, like when you're when you're adding extra cylinders. So really, like you start with one cylinder, you kind of get it optimized and it all starts to work. You add two other cylinders, maybe you make, maybe you make a three cylinder engine. It sounds like you're saying that there are some subtle interactions between now that uh, you have three cylinders moving instead of just one cylinder that that can be something that has to be accounted for. Correct. Is it um, in, in it, terms of like airflow in and out or even, even just on a mechanical level, just because yeah, they're sitting it, next to it, each it, other? It, it doesn't. So it's just because it's turbocharged doesn't mean it's still not an air pump with resonant right. frequencies. You, you still have these waves that are coming back and forth multiple times between yeah. each combustion cycle and when they're hitting and coming in disrupts what's going on in the chamber. Um, very critical with, you know, what's going on in modern day formula one, because they're running in such lean conditions where it is such a knife edge to have the thing operating correctly. Um, that if you had something that's funky, it's not going to represent. So you spend a lot of time on the single cylinder, making sure that what you have running correlates to the V6 and vice versa. Okay. Um, so you have something that looks good and you go ahead and make a change to one and then you want to test it on the other in the V6 to make sure it matches what you put a bunch of time into in the single. Right. Because uh, the single gets a lot more dyno time. Sure, sure. 
it's also far cheaper to iterate designs on. So you do a new right. head, a new port, a new piston, a new pre-chamber, new fuel injector, new cooling system, new anything. It all goes there first. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. Well, and so now here's the other question I, I threw out at you is like knowing that you have both of those like perspectives on working with an engine coming from an existing building one from the ground up. I wanted to pick your brain about Subaru engines because you're a Subaru guy. <laughs> and yeah, but I guess I, I think my question to you was, what the heck was Subaru thinking? Or maybe maybe in a more positive sense than that. But it's you know the EJ engine is an interesting one, and in that it's been around for so long. And I I want to see what your perspective is on like why did they do what they do or what they did? Like why is the EJ the way that it is? And what are some of the benefits and like what were they going for? Or what would you guess? I guess, what do you mean by what? So there's so many EJs and they've done so many things and evolved it. So let's we'll start at the, at the beginning. So first, you know, go before the EJ, they had the EA engine mm -hmm. and the ER. So those that don't know, you know, the flat six fans, they actually had an ER 27 came in. Was it the Alcyon or no, what's it called? I can't remember that little wedge looking Subaru that they had. Oh, anyway, the XT, the XT6. Was it XT6? Yeah. That yep. one. Uh, very futuristic from the eighties. Yeah. Yep. Um, XT6. And they had the EA. Uh, and Subaru's big, their whole kind of thing that they were known for at that point is they started really getting to be, people know us because we're all-wheel drive and we have the symmetrical all-wheel drive system. They still give you that yep. sales pitch now. So the EA and the ER kind of went by the wayside when the EJ came out. Time for a new engine evolution. Emissions rules change. Yep. Performance levels kind of change. That stuff kind of moves along, right? Um, so you go to the, we're talking realistic. This work was probably done in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Being they didn't have CAD system simulation like we do. And if I recall, I think the first EJ came out like 1990 or something, 89. When, when I the think first it was legacy 89 Legacy, out. yeah. Yeah, so you're going to say this work realistically probably kicked off in the mid to early 80s. Easy, yeah. Like, they started working on this when I was born type of thing. Like, right. now I just dated myself, but... Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so if that gives you an idea of how old that architecture is. And then they kept moving along and evolving it for think about how much emissions have changed and what regulations they have to follow and how much power they're supposed to be making on this thing, right? Yeah. So they started with a split case transmission. Everybody knows the super five speed grenades when you start making power, but it came out with, you know, 110 horsepower EJ18. Which and, was a oh, lot. Was the, the, the pepped up, I think the, I might be wrong here, but the legacy SS and the, for what they had overseas, you know, the legacy, um, what do they call their sporty one? Is it just legacy turbo? Uh, Liberty? Liberty turbo? No, Liberty's just Australia. Uh, okay. But anyway, so the ones like Colin McRae and all, they used to yeah. race. And, was, and they had the two-liter closed deck, EJ20G. You know, as we know, the 20G, the closed deck one, even though that doesn't just mean closed deck. Right. As I learned while I was over there. It oh, just yeah. Means it's a center, it just means it's a center thrust bearing. So oh. Like my, so my right-hand drive, my right-hand drive GF8, it has an EJ20G, yeah. but it just means it's a center thrust bearing. It's an open deck, just like an EJ205. Really? Yeah. So okay. anyway. Ooh. That, Getting, getting on a tangent here. Yes. Um, I think they did quite well taking EJ20 that was, you know, originally designed in the mid 80s and still keeping it in production and through all the emissions regs and everything until just last year. Yeah. Think about it, the basis of that engine that was still in production in the SDI last year started its work in the 80s. In the 80s and they yeah. kept trying to glom onto it and, oh, we need more displacement. All right, we'll make an EJ25. We'll add some stroke right. and add some bore. Uh, and, you know, oh, now we're going to add variable cam timing to help us get away with, you know, emissions because the tumble generator valves weren't quite enough for cold start emissions. Now I have to add this. Oh, now I have to add exhaust AVCS as well. Oh, well, now I need to add an air pump for emissions too. And right. EGR as well. And you look at all these things that got added to this thing that was never designed to be there originally. And they kept sticking it on. And I, I mean, for what it is, I think it did all right. And, um, and we, I mean, how much, how much would you say when you, when you talk about emissions, which, I mean, obviously we know like, Partic particles coming out the tailpipe, but how much of that is related to efficiency? Like, or efficiency. or more is it is it more efficient or more a more complete burn? Is, is so that where the emissions the come from? Fun thing about emissions is fuel efficiency doesn't matter at all. Right. So so fuel efficiency doesn't really care so long as what's coming out your tailpipe is clean enough to pass. Sorry, um, I guess that's efficient... more so. That's really more so in the diesel world, where you'll more about the... run. Go ahead. Oh, is it more about like a, a more efficient or more complete burn or like how, how the air is getting into being processed and then out of the cylinder? Oh, did I lose you? 
yes well oh, about, sorry. yes it's it's a it's about how no it, it, was, it was glitching out for a second but right. it, it's yes how the air gets in and out is part of the efficiency but you have so many efficiencies thermal efficiency sure. and fuel efficiency and power sure. density and all these other things which people think oh it makes so much power it's more efficient no that just means you have more power per cc right that's just power okay. density yeah. um doesn't necessarily mean you're efficient because usually when you're going to throw a bunch of boost at something your fuel efficiency drops break specific fuel consumption goes to crap sure um because you're burning a lot more fuel because there's a lot more right. air to burn. And yeah. so that's the really cool thing where, you know, kind of something that uh, I want to get into later is trickle down technology is where Formula One really started pushing this is Formula One came in uh, to annoy every race engineer out there and said, we're going to give you a fuel flow restriction as opposed to an air restrictor like everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of paint a picture for those that aren't uh, F1 nerds out there, uh, what happens is for your fuel flow restriction, you have a given flow rate you can have throughout your speed range. And at 10,500 is where you hit your peak fuel flow rate. So for modern engines, I want to say it's 100 kilograms an hour. It's your max fuel flow okay. rate. Rough numbers for guys, it's 220 pounds an hour. Um, so convert that as you want to gallons or liters or whatever. T -t Take your preference. Um, but to give you, that's kind of a rough idea. So at 10,500, you finally get your full fuel flow, but it caps there. So anything past there, you know, on the way it's up no to 15,000, which is the red line you're allowed to spin to by the rules, it becomes a thing of you want to, you know, it's not worth spinning faster if you can't make efficient power there because then you're just wasting energy. Right. Um, so the real thing is after 10, after you hit 10,500 RPM and you hit your 100 kilograms an hour, you're just running further and further into lean. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that are sitting there looking at how much fuel flow that is, comparing it to their modern injectors and what they're putting in their Subaru, they'll realize really quick that's not a lot of fuel. So right. these guys are running really, really, really lean. Um, of course, they're doing it with 102 RON and really big compression ratios, really big boost, and that gets into the whole thermodynamic side. Right. Um, but part of what happens is they also figured out how to run lean and how to run really efficient and get really good homogenous mixture and get really good tumble coming into the chamber. And all these things come into going, all right, well, we've got good tumble coming in. We're getting good atomization. So when it comes up for your charge, your air fuel distribution is really good and you get really combustion or really efficient combustion. So you don't mm. have all this extra fuel sitting around and, oh yeah, you also didn't like in a lot of production cars, it, it irks me is where they go ahead and take the GDI injector and bounce it off of the piston to direct it towards the spark plug right. so they can run lean. Yeah. Um, which is a well-known way of, I'll say, creating more particulate matter, which is something that is heavily regulated in the diesel world. And it's, if I recall, I think Europe and other countries have started pushing it for gas as okay. well because they realize what they're doing. Um, but you start finding ways to actually make better injection, better power, cl more cleanly. Because, because the restriction is the amount of fuel you have to work with. So now that is the limiting factor. Right. And so now you have to get creative and think outside the box. And obviously- And you want to make- yeah, I want to make more power, figure out how to run faster. And how do you run faster other than finding how to get better mixture and better cooling? Because that's the other right. thing, running such big compression ratios. And I'll say charge air temps are not cold in a Formula One car. Sure. It kind of becomes one where the hotter it can be, the better, because it's less intercooler. So you try to find that balance. Wow, um, okay. But, uh, well, you think about it, ultimately the lap time is what a Formula yeah. One car wants, right? But what's the quickest sure. way around this track? If I'm not carrying intercoolers and I can still make enough power, cool, then, then sure. I don't need it. Yeah. Um, hmm. but yeah, it all becomes a balancing act and there's a lot of people with bigger brains than me that are really good at math and do a lot of number crunching and simulation work to kind of see what delivers the best average lap time on what you're giving them. What's possible. So, Do you think that, that this is, this is the arena that some of the, some of the OE manufacturers are now having to start to look at because like in, to a certain extent, the fuel economy standards that production cars now have to meet in some mm -hmm. ways is now limiting how much fuel you can actually use? I would I would say yes. Uh, and it's one that, it's a personal irk, because um, my time at Roush Yates, I also did NASCAR. Uh, okay. I've never been a massive NASCAR fan. The engineering has always been super top-notch, even though they make them use, I'll say, archaic technologies, right? They yeah. always had the old two-valve push rod. They had a basic, you know, steel tube chassis. They, they had all this stuff for forever, right? Yeah. Um, this past year, they finally went to a newer car. They've got a rear transaxle. They've got, you know, sequential. They've got multiple gears. So they're not just lugging one gear from, you know, 
three or 4,000 RPM. So, you know, eight or 9,000 or back in the old days, it's 10,000 RPM, you know? So now they're actually have a range to operate in, but they've also capped the power massively. They make them run restrictors all the time. Now mm-hmm. it's not just at super speedways. They're always restricted for super speedways. It gets an even smaller restrictor. Hmm. And I was like, this was a massive growing opportunity where NASCAR could go out to Ford and to Toyota and to GM and maybe pull Dodge back in and get others in and say, hey, you know what? Here's a good Ray. We're going to go ahead and do fuel flow restriction too and make these guys figure out how to run a Nash Asprey right. V8 lean and clean. And it's right. actually going to be trickle down and, you know, something that would go back to your F-150 in your you know, driveway. But yeah, um, they, they have chosen not to do that. They stuck with the predictable way and just threw a restrictor on the thing. Sure. Um, understood for initial, you, you can't pop out an engine to do that in a year. And it would be a right. massive investment overhaul from – OEMs to back the race teams to do the development to get the combustion work going. So give them five years and they could be doing something like that. But yeah. Well, and I'm guessing that, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you have a sense. I'll ask it anyway, but like, is this the kind of thing where there is one solution and everybody is using the same kind of solution or is it something where there's maybe two or three different solutions that, that have benefits and drawbacks. And so depending on the team, there's, there's maybe taking one approach versus another. I will say the strategies for combustion do vary from the various teams. Um, being at Red Bull, it's quite nice because we had people from numerous different teams on the grid. And there are only so many there. Um, right. Yeah. And they all were doing certain aspects of it differently from the rest. Yeah. So, so, I mean, if, it, if it's, there's, it's, well, if there's, different there's still aspects. something to be learned there. There's still yeah. something to be learned. They're not all doing the same thing. It's not like it's, oh, this is the only way forward. Yeah, that means there's still there's still room to explore. There's there's not right. one and only one solution. So, yeah, I mean, if if you've got somebody that's running in a NASCAR environment like a natural aspirated V8, and they start using some of like the basic principles and playing in that arena, versus yeah. like a force induction small displacement engine playing in that arena, and that yeah, that could be a really interesting way to kind of really get yeah. to the bottom of how do you make that work well for everybody. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, So back to the Subaru thing. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) uh, So the EJ had been kicked along for a long time. Um, And and you really look at what it started as you look at old pictures of them. And they're like, there's so much room in the engine bay. And you you look at the modern engines here, there's stuff everywhere, air ducting Mm -hmm. pipes wrapping around and EGR on the backside and TGVs and sensors and everything. Yeah. So it it changed a lot. (laughs) Same base architecture, same deck height, same everything else still confined by the same, you know, cam centers. Like it, it all largely stayed the same. Yeah. Um, and to an so, extent, that's that's what makes them cool, because there's a little bit of range to interchange parts because yeah. the, the cylinder block is the cylinder block. And it's always been the cylinder block and the, the holes for the head studs are basically pretty much I think they're unchanged. I'm going to say that they're unchanged. Yep. And now you can. All right. Well, here's this one cylinder head. Well, what about this one cylinder head? What can you what can you do as far as changing things out, trying a more modern part on an, on an older block, those sorts of things, and you come up with yeah. some interesting combinations. Oh, yeah, there are guys who still definitely hunt down the, uh, you know, the EJ22 Turbo yeah. uh, block and, and the early EJ20Gs, which are closed deck blocks, and guys look for those. And the biggest thing is converting, you know, the, the center thrust to a, a number five main thrust. Yep. Um, some guys want to block the piston squirt jets, which I'm not a fan of, but mm-hmm. uh, if anything, I'd improve the piston squirt jets, but right. Um, Get a little bit more oil a... spring under, under the bottom of the piston, more, more heat yeah, management. Yeah. 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 Tighten up your piston wall clearance, get less cam, have a more stable piston and fire, you know, firing up. Yeah. So, you know, cold starts instead of having your forge piston slapping around. Right. Um, Why do you whether think you can hear it or not? It's still oh. slapping around. Uh, Oh yeah, a really loose one will be slapping around. You'll hear that piston slap, but even one that's tight, it's still because the skirt is actually rounded until it gets hot mm-hmm. and squares itself up. Right. So. Which is that's a wild thing. I to think of that the that the pistons are actually like con- conical is probably the wrong term, but like not they're not it's square. Barreled. So so it's so it is literally barreled this way. And the yeah. thing you also see is measuring you know across the piston here versus here. You'll have a different measurement as well. Because they have different oh. growth due to the amount of material on the bottom and the material you have from here. So it's hottest yep. here, coldest on the bottom where you're spraying your oil. Yeah. So hotter here, thermal expansion, it'll grow more, right? So that's where yep. that round becomes well, straight. straight, right? It's not actually straight, but straight straighter. enough. Straight straighter, enough. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that also tightens up that clearance that you have at the top, which then yeah. allows it not to oscillate when it's coming around top to center. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. Well, why do you think Subaru went with such an over square engine? Like, is what is can just from a just a base standpoint? Like, what what do you think they were going for by by that design? I think initially, um, so the original we'll say EJ twenty, right? That was the staple. It was a ninety two millimeter bore and a seventy five millimeter stroke. Um, it's not really outrageous. Uh, it, it is quite over square though for, for a production car, but they also had dual overhead dual overhead cams on top of that and they also had to fit it into essentially a front you know right location of a car yeah where it still would have frame rails outside of that and so it had room to serve spark plugs and you know sure. it's this whole thing that kind of trickles along and they needed a two liter engine because they're going rally racing right so when you go ahead and kind of box yourself in, you could have gone with a longer stroke, but that would push your deck height out and then your head's out further. And then your engine, you know, your frame rails have this issue. Um, so I guess they decided that the bore spacing was probably the way to go. They said on a 92 mil bore, we'd probably get enough airflow and enough motion on, you know, charge air coming in. that It's good enough. Um, it's kind of where you start with an engine, right? You start with yeah. airflow. It's all an air pump. So when you go back to those sur first surfaces, right, you've got your combustion surface, you've got your ports coming in, you choose your valve size. Kind of what point do you choose which valve size? Well, do I have enough airflow for what I'm expecting it to do? Yes. Cool. Valve's big enough. You don't have to go any bigger. Hmm. You know, the other thing is you kind of go with your bore size. So if you're going to have the same given pressure, so say you have the same 35 mil restrictor, that's going to kind of loosely box in what you're going to have for peak boost pressure that you can get right. on a realistic turbo that will perform well on a rally stage. Um, and then you also have the same cap. I think they're like 10 to one in the WRC days. This would have been before that. This was group A days. Yeah. Um, so we'll go and say, say, you know, roughly same boost, same compression ratio. You then also kind of, you know, go, all right, well, my pressure is in the cylinder the same. Uh, if I can keep my combustion efficiency without dropping off, then I'll have roughly the same peak combustion pressure. And the combustion pressure, it, well, you, you go and take that and you have your surface area of your piston. The bigger your piston is, the more force you literally have driving your piston down. Right. So With the same combustion if, pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have the same pressure, because you're literally the same boost pressure, same um, compression ratio, and you get all the airflow in, and you're not such a large valve that you're hindering, you know, flow in or performance or something else like that, having a lazy port, not so much a problem with anti-lagging turbo systems, but on the production side where it's yeah. supposed to do emissions and be a daily driver, that is a thing to consider. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you kind of go, all right, cool. The, the bigger bore actually helps me. Interesting. And yeah. that, it's crazy to think that, like, the fact that they wanted to use a boxer engine, the fact that they wanted to put it in between the frame rails kind of dictated the initial layout of what they had to work with. And then just basically the large piston size, they would try to use that to their advantage because they had to, because they wanted to fit it into this limited space. Right. Yeah. You can fit a bigger valve. You can flow more air. Yeah. And if you can flow more air, you can actually have a less aggressive cam. You can back off on, you know, valve train stresses and lighten up your valve springs and right. you know, all kinds of other things you can do if you can fit a bigger valve. Interesting. Um, so, Pros and cons to all of it. Yeah. What do you uh, think? Now, uh, go I, I just want to ask you about the bore size too that I've always wondered. Is it in terms of Ringlands? Because Subarus and Ringlands, but the, these terms get tossed around a lot. EJ twenty fives in Ringlands. Yeah. Okay. EJ twenty fives. Do you think that the size, the fact that it's an oversquared engine, the fact that you have such a large piston, is in part what makes the Ringlands more vulnerable, or does it? Do you think it's more just to do with the, the metallurgy, plain and simple? I, I think it realistically, it's the metallurgy. Metallurgy. Okay. Look, uh, look at guys with, you know, uh, let's say built engines, guys who've gone to forge pistons, mm -hmm. who's having problems mm -hmm. with ring lands. Sure. Okay. Right. So by that point, you're, yeah, you're, you're melting yeah. pistons because something went horribly wrong. You, you skipped the ring lands and went right to now, the. Now, yeah. now, guys that guys that are making big, big power, you can actually start beating the ring land down. Um, usually, I, you know, without having pistons in front of me and actually, you know, doing a hardness test on them and seeing what they've annealed to. I think a lot of that is due to people not having sufficient cooling on the piston. Mm -hmm. um, part of why I'm also a big fan of the oil squirters. Um, right. They, they regulate that piston temperature. It helps in all regards. Um, but yeah, so what happens is aluminum gets hot, it starts annealing. Uh, when it starts annealing, it's it soft and it's no longer as strong as it once was. So you start having these big pressures. Well, you those big pressures also hit that top ring land as well. Mm -hmm. If your big ring's not super thick, like, you know, in terms of how far it actually goes, how deep that groove is, right? Right. The, the narrower that is, the more loading you have on that ring for that same given pressure that ring's holding. Because that pressure is hitting that ring the same right. way. So that's then translating into that top portion of that ring or the bottom portion of that ring land. And so if it started kneeling and started softening, you start beating that ring land down. 
And I think in most cases, a lot of guys say, oh, look, I'm making great power. I'm like, yeah, you might be, you, but that's not why that piston's necessarily failing. You've probably overheated it too. So it's, right. it's, there's another force at play here. So, so the, you have the ring. It's, I mean, they're called compression rings. So the the compression force is hitting that ring, and that ring is supported by the architecture of the piston, mm-hmm. which is which is the ring land. And so, like the the pressure, the heat, and then the metallurgy, it all would play a factor there. Right. So. Wow. And and as it all gets hot, and the other thing is, so you you look at a piston. If you ever take a piston, actually, really look at it and grab it, start taking measurements and see how deep pockets are and what things are going on. It's just a off the shelf model piston. That's nothing fancy. It's just sitting yeah. on a desk, desk ornament from somewhere along the way. Um, you start seeing where things are thick and how much materials wear and how much it's cooling. And like these mollas, mala does a really nice piston. Um, things you might not be able to see, for instance, is this dish here mm-hmm. or, or a dish. This pocket is not machined. Yeah. It's still the raw forging. This is still raw forging. All of them are. Yeah. This one's much thicker than this one. And likewise on the opposing side, this one's much thicker than this one it's because it was a two valve forging and because of oh, cost wow. they never decided to go ahead and say well you know it's worth us dealing with it and let's fix this and machine it it would have taken them an extra minute on the mill to go ahead and cut it while they're already cleaning up everything else here rotate it over the five axis and clean them up making the same depth but they didn't so what's going to happen is you're going to have these two spots where they're thicker they're going to be hotter because they're going to hold these more two heat. spots because they're thinner so yeah they'll they'll have more heat in them um so it becomes just little stuff like that in the performance aftermarket. That if you don't know what you're looking at, you got bought mollas. They're the best thing ever. They make all kinds of good stuff. They're an OEM supplier. They're only as good as they're going to spend money on it. And right. if you don't know what you're looking at, there's still room to optimize things and make it better. So a lot of these things where people start taking stuff like this and trying to make it a race engine. They're, they're wanting to do a season or two seasons as a time attack where they're turning mm-hmm. this thing way up fast, way higher than what the original engineers probably planned it to do. Yeah, like I probably designed this to be, you know, maybe a weekend track street and strip car guys can take the drab strip then it's really his friday driver type of application it's very different when you're sitting there running hot laps and what's essentially you know a 10 or nine second or even eight second car yeah okay that brings uh, that gives me an interesting question when you're when you're doing engine development regardless of which direction you're coming at it how much like there there's the additive side where you're, you're you have a design you're modifying design you're 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 testing you're you're making power all that sort of thing where does the teardown come in? Like how, how often or, or how do you evaluate? Like do you run it maybe for like 10 hours on the engine dyno. Do you, do you then tear it down and, and reanalyze all the parts or look for? So if, so if it's like a stresses? brand new design, yeah. like, a, you know, this is the first single cylinder you've put together this way. We'll pretend we're back in the Formula One world. Yeah. yeah. If, if it's the first time you've run this bottom in, you know, this cylinder head, this kind of stuff, this new valve change geometry you did. Yeah. T- 10 hours is probably a reasonable time to go ahead and take it apart. Just give it the look over and say, hey, does everything look healthy? Everybody happy? Um, mm-hmm. OS might be more like 40 hours. Um, if you realize stuff, you've done teardowns at 40 hours and bearings and everything else are still looking good. But you're curious to see how far your bearings go. Uh, but, you know, you're starting to lose a little bit of ring seal. All right, well, you know, you're losing ring seal. That's fine. We're okay with that. We know that's happening. We know the rings have given up the ghost. Not that mm-hmm. they're completely lost. But, all right, well, let's see how much further we can go with these bearings. Where are the bearings out? You know, just as a hypothetical, mm-hmm. you can go ahead and push it and say, all right, well, we know we have essentially too much bearing surface. Now we can back off on bearings a bit, save some power. Oh, because like in reality, they're, they're no longer dying together, right? So if the ring's given up the ghost at 40 hours, and we'll say that's the expected life of an engine, but your bearings still have excess life, we can take a little bit of life out of them. Or okay. maybe reduce oil pressure a bit. Or, you know, see, you know, there, there are all kinds of knobs you can turn, but mm. you might just go ahead and skinny up that rod bearing a little bit. So it'll be in a big fat rod bearing. And so, if you skinny up that rod bearing, it lets you put a little bit more meat back into your crank. So it's not going to be as flimsy and flexy, but. Okay. So you can actually, yeah, so you, you can learn like where, where you're starting to see where that tells you like, okay, well now you're getting close to the end of this, but things that aren't showing where, well, now you can modify them and right. get it to the point where like, by the time you get to the desired, like say 50 hours of runtime and everything is worn out, perfect, throw it in the trash, put in something new, start over again. Right. So the yeah. other thing um, that goes into this, I, I have a few things that I see a lot of guys do, and you maybe seen me post on it on, and we've got those, you know, track Subies page yeah. on Facebook and I post on there from time to time. And I'm always blown away by how many guys, just simple indicators you can have on your engine to no health. Everyone who's really mad because their engine blew up and I had no yep. clue it was going to blow up because you've never actually paid attention to anything. You didn't track anything to say it's actually healthy. Doing yeah. impression tests doesn't tell you your engine's healthy. Doing a leak down test is a better indicator by far. Yep. So leak down test is a simple one you can do. 
Other ones, do your oil analysis regularly, especially if it's a track car. If yeah. you're starting to have bearing wear, you'll start seeing the PPM count. And mm -hmm. you can actually calculate if you know how much oil you have in the PPM, you have an idea roughly of how much percent of bearing is actually now gone. Like you can start doing these numbers and actually go, all right, bearings are actually starting to wear. Like this is the thing. Oh, we're starting to get copper. We're through. We're through. Our top. All right. Uh, this is getting ready to go. We should go and do a R&R &R on this, you know, before okay. it gets really expensive. Yeah. So things like that. Uh, other ones, indicators. I was talking with someone just this week about this. Crankcase pressure. Mm -hmm. How many times I tell people to monitor crankcase pressure? It's a simple indicator of something's going wrong or right. Water pressure as well. That's more of a head gasket thing because performance aftermarket. Head studs being what they are, questionable machine shops doing questionable RA finishes on heads and blocks. And, you know, then yep. without even getting into the head gasket argument of different ways of sealing, you know, it's a good indicator to say, hey, I'm, you know what? I'm yeah. doing a full pull. My water, I'm getting spikes in my water pressure. Yeah, something's burping out. You know, combustion yep. gases are getting out. Yeah. Um, so it's just a few real simple things you can do that aren't grossly expensive that you can just add to your logger and check your health of your engine, get a brand new engine. You'll seal it, seal in. You can see how much vacuum it pulls at idle. It's a good indicator, just real rough indicator of how tight the engine is tight, right. you know, right. how good your ring seal is. And that's kind of a baseline. So, you know, that's what it pulls at vacuum when it's good and hot at operating temp. Yay. Thermostats. It keeps it all the same and happy. Yep. And then likewise, you go in when you're running it and say you're running a consistently same kind of setup, you'll have roughly the same sort of blow by gases and you'll have, roughly the same crankcase pressure. And if you see that over time start going up, you know, your rings are letting go. Do a leak down test. Oh yeah, look, it's um, at 85% on basically all these cylinders. They're dropping. They used to be at 90. Huh, yeah. Okay, rings are letting go. Time to schedule yep. an R&R &R at the end of the season if it gets to there, you know. So all these things you can look at that lets you know before it gets really expensive. Yeah. Well, you, you don't have to tell me about crankcase pressure. I am I am a believer. Um, <laughs> I, I am aware. But... I, I love your uh, YouTube series that you've done with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and in fact, with, I mean, I guess spoilers, but it'll come out sooner or later. We're actually putting a standalone in the car and we're going to start being able to data log crankcase pressure, crankcase pressure nice. and coolant pressure uh, for exactly the reason you said. Yeah. Um, I think what, I mean, just from, from the people that I've talked to, I think part of what intimidates people about that to a certain extent is that they don't know what they should be looking for. Right. But I think the great point that you just made is like, you don't have to know what you're looking for. You initially just need the data because the more that you run it, the more data you collect, the more you can see the pattern of what mm -hmm. the engine does, you know what the normal is. And you then, the yeah. yeah, you get the baseline. Then once you start to see an anomaly, then you know what's an anomaly. Yeah. You know? Or you see, you know, the trend starts going up or down. You're going, all right, something is changing. What, what, right. is, what is letting go? Right. Yeah. 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 The, now, that, in a dry sump system, a dry sump system, is, it's nicer because <laughs> you're on a fixed yeah. system and it's basically pulling to a given pressure and you know that and you have, you know, pressure increase, well, then something's escaping that's not supposed to be there, you know, crack the piston or massive right. or, blow by on a ring. Or it's not pumping. Or, or the other one is you might just have a crack in something, in a valve cover or something that simple, but, you know, develop yeah. a leak. But, yep. Um, I guess, you know what, since you brought it up, what is your opinion of the necessity of a dry sump on a Subaru engine? For a race car, not for a street car. Uh, I'd, for, I'd for a street car, it doesn't make sense, I don't it, think. It, I would say it would depend on your level of race car. Um, I'm currently building my coupe to run in grid life street mod. Um, and I plan on it being a wet sump. Mm -hmm. You'll see people that preach dry sump. Uh, I also look at the existing wet sumps. and know that there's room for improvement on all of the ones that are on the market. Um, so I'll be working on my own, you know, oil sump for my car. And if it's cost effective, people want it, then it might come out as a three of my product, but otherwise it's going on my car and, I'll test and evaluate. And I have a couple of guys who I know want it, mm -hmm. you know, close friends who want to test it on their race cars. So great race car friends have race car friends. So, yeah. Always. Um, yeah. So I've got a few wet sumps bits coming out um, because I think for most people buying a dry sump, if it's not necessary is a massive expense that I don't think a lot of guys at the Subaru level are at in terms of needing. Hmm. so long as they actually take care of the wet sump system itself. And the other thing is, yeah, a dry sump system can add power if done properly. Most people don't have the, I'll say the tools necessary to make it advantageous to go ahead and make power for you going and spending four grand. So basically it's, you know, four or five grand, if not more in terms of just insurance. Sure. Um, I would say a properly set up wet sump system and um, we'll take your pick of, I'll say, uh, oil uh, insertion systems, okay. if you will. Yeah. to uh, go ahead and be a Band-Aid. So. Sure. Well, see, I think 
my opinion on it is that it's I would I would play devil's advocate there and say that it's more important for even like mid tier Subaru race cars and up because of the reliability that it brings in terms of oil pressure, but also because of the fact that the dry sumps eliminate basically eliminate the PCV system. Mm-hmm. And and the PCV system like can be really problematic on the EJ platform, even if you have intervention methods, inter oil separation and so forth. And I, my sense, I guess, what is your take on this? My sense is that issues with the PCV system are more to blame for engine failures than in, than issues with the oil pressure system, like the oil pump system. I wouldn't blame the PCV. PCV specifically, crankcase ventilation. Okay, crankcase ventilation. So, so I yeah. would say if you uh, yes, now it's in the same volume as your you know your oil system, your wet slush. Right. But right. I would say oil slush. I would blame it on the PCV system, right? Okay. So yeah. if you're going to have oil slosh in the cylinder head, which everybody, <laughs> anyone with an EJ205 who's taken a really, really, really long, like cloverleaf exit on an interstate is a very spirited thing, might have spun a rod bearing. Raise your hand. Right. Um, right. Then right. again, I knew that engine was going anyway, so I didn't really care. <laughs> but uh, yeah, came out the other side of that with, uh, you know, cousin Rodney just knocking away. Yeah. Um, so yeah, y- y- you learn. And one of the things is, I think a lot of it in the OEM system is keeping the oil where you want the oil to be yeah which is around so if you had a wet sump if you had a wet sump where you knew you could keep the oil in the pan would you be concerned with it if you knew that oil would never leave the pan and go into your head you just have to wait to come out of the corner for whatever valve train oil you had to go back into the pan so would you be concerned not as much not as much right what would be your concern at that point i'm just curious if i knew that the oil was in the pan so, so ventilation systems should still be fine. Mm-hmm. Nothing should be bubbling. Nothing be puking oil. You're not going to have, you know, three quarts of oil sloshing that head because you're in a high G turn. And I guess right. for most people don't realize, you know, when, when you're taking a turn, say, here's your Subaru, right? Yeah. So you're going to take a one G turn. You're essentially at a 45 degree angle. Right. So your pans down here, all that oil is just going in here into your head. Right. So. It, well, I think once you, once you know that the pan is going to have oil and the pickup is going to be covered, then I think the focus would turn to how the oil gets to the engine, goes through the engine versus trying to keep it in the pan. Keeping it in the pan right. is that's, that's job number one. Yeah. And that's, I guess, but the dry sump, that's the advantage is you don't have the worry about the oil getting into the engine because it's stored in this external tank. Right. So you know that yeah. you're always going to have that flow. And so on a similar note, and you hit on it is where people say that they have, you know, a lack of oil flow. Or, or that they had starvation. How do you know? How many people run right. data fast enough and actually log it and look at actual data to say that they do have starvation or do not have starvation? Right. Yeah. So it's almost like data logging. Like data logging is one of those big missing, like that. that is the data is power for race yeah. cars. Yeah. Yeah. Not knowledge is power. Yeah. Data power. It's one of the old, uh, I got mine on the shelf somewhere over there. I can't think of the name of the author, but yeah. Yeah. It's one of those old uh, textbooks of mine. But well, yeah. It's- and when you're, if, if you're doing a teardown and you've had a failure, you can see you can see the signs of wear. You can see the damage. You can see the signs of wear. Mm-hmm. But it's like you you have to kind of you're doing a forensic analysis, but you kind of have to guess. Well, where is the chicken? Where is the egg? What right. what? How well, do these things relate? So so the other thing is if you're actually tracking your bearings and watching things and see how things are running, you'll have signs. So say for instance you took. You know, oil analysis, sent it out, saw that you had excessive bearing wear, say, hey, you know what? Yeah, had starvation issues that I thought I saw in this last plot. You know, for most people, I recommend doing an XY scatter plot to check your oil Mm -hmm. Um, and also do that scatter plot at the same kind of temperature. I really do like thermostatically controlled oil systems. So, you know, you're at least at the same rough operating temperature. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not really cold and thick when I just did a quick pull to check something at home, make sure it was fine versus I'm at the track and now I'm up, you know, 40 degrees in oil temperature. Um, mm-hmm. That doesn't really help you a lot because your oil pressure will automatically be down just because it's so hot. The sky speeds down, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so say for instance you had a hot engine and you know down the straight you're doing a couple of pulls, just ripping, you know, grabbing a few gears, get up fifth, sixth, if, well, six, fifth and sixth if you're you know time attack car with some good power. But you know mm-hmm. y- you've got a good X Y scatter plot. You can pull in and see where your oil pressure is, and you'll have this beautiful curve as your well I'll go the other way. So as you know RPMs increasing, oil pressure is increasing, and right. as you start going through the rest of the track, you'll start seeing these points that drop out. You get a couple little flyers here and there yep. where you're getting it drop out and go, all right, yeah, you're having some amount of starvation or it's aeration. It's not necessarily you're starving. Right. It could also be 
that you're now pulling from oil that's so low in the tank because not enough is in the actual I should take pan. I'll say pan. Right. That there's not enough in the pan that you're now you're starting to pull that upper layer, which is aeration, which is where air and oil are now essentially kind of a foam, a froth. Right. Think of a latte on top of your oil. Yeah. Um, and the thing is getting aeration out of oil is really hard to do. It mm -hmm. takes time. It takes mechanical separation. Usually you'll spin it in like a race engine that has, you know, a serious like endurance engine type application or, you know, Formula One engine where I'll, I'll say it's endurance because it has to run six Grand Prix. Yeah. Um, but you go ahead and take this into consideration then for something that's just a track car, you know, run HPDEs. Don't think that's a real thing. If you're a time attack car, it's just going to go run some sprints. Maybe. Probably, probably but not a real issue. Like, kind of, you know, kind of like a street mod car, not a thing. Unlimited car, absolutely. I'd try something that because how, how does arrow arrow plays into this? But but can you can you talk on maybe how arrow plays into it? Into which part? Well, like monitoring the oil pressure and maybe going to dry some because of the the quartering loads. I would so I if, would guess. So if you're gonna yeah. so you're essentially if I have more cornering cheese is what you mean by yeah. how arrow plays. Yeah. In. yeah, it'll it'll try and sling that oil further out. <laughs> right. Um. Right. You know, going back to here's your Subaru, right? So uh, yep. you know it'll. 45 degrees, I'd actually have to do the math on it real quick, but say two yeah. Gs, you're at like uh, 66 degrees now. And, right. and you and so your, your pan's still here. It's really easy trying to just push all that oil on over because that's just where yeah. your new gravity, right? So you have two yep. Gs that are slinging you outward and only one G pulling it down, right? So Yeah, and that's, I think, when people try and add aero and, and big wings, big splitters and get a lot more grip and, and increase quartering speeds and stuff like that, that's one of those aspects that, it can just it can just get overlooked so easily that like you're you're really right. putting a lot more stress on your oiling system because th those that grip is also stressing the oiling. Right, there's a correlation there. Um, and so with that being said, it is when guys go on the track forms and ask for input on you know what 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 oil pan should I run? Which baffle should I run? This that and the other. People just say whatever they bought. Sure. No one has. No one is presenting data, or very, very rarely do you actually see data of people saying, here's what I had before, here's what I have now. Yeah. Or, hey, you know, I used to run, you know, brand A, and now I've gone to brand B, and this is what my plots look like on similar, you know, G cornering, similar temperature kind of days. Like, here, here's what I have yeah. in my deltas. And even then, if it's, you know, the same car, even if it's different days, one's running in wintertime, runs, say it's an autocross guy, one's in the fall, one's in the summer. All right, his yeah. base pressure might be different. But on that XY scatter plot, you'll see where that curve is, where all these points are here. It looks really happy. Right. And how many are you having beneath that? So I should also say pressure is going to be, you know, your Y axis and you have RPM as your X axis. Okay. And for that given speed you should have, because, you know, a simple gear rate or pump, when you're turning the engine, it's going to positively displace this much volume. That little wedge you got there is what's going to come yep. out. And so, yeah, I've got all kinds of toys on my desk. But uh, pretty, pretty good, pretty good visual aids. Yeah, yes. yeah, it helps more than just, you know, well, the thing spins in the thing. Yep. Um, even oh. then, a uh, baseline, you'll see where the pressure is and you'll see starvation moments and you'll see that it's either improved or worse. And, and so, is, is that why you say, well, talk about the scatter plot because I, I, I know that you, that's what you've said and, and I think you've okay. given some re rationale for why a scatter plot, but maybe kind of explain what so that is and maybe why an, a scatter plot. An XY scatter plot is where you take the data points that are logged. And you literally drop them according to uh, kind of like coordinates. Pretend you're playing yeah. Battleship, right? So you, you, your x-axis runs across, and we'll say, you know, you know, 0, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 RPM, whatever you're running, right? Yeah. So that'll be x-axis, and you'll have oil pressure running up here. So we'll say, you know, whether you're using bar or PSI, your incremental increases. And so as engine speed increases, so say, for instance, you're doing a nice fourth-year pull, you'll see, you should see on a straightaway, just a good, clean, you know, line. And yeah. you'll see, where, and you'll see where the pump starts to relieve. You'll see where it starts opening, and it'll kind of make an E and kind of start doing a plateau. It'll be at a different line, not necessarily going to be flat. Sometimes it might start falling off. Sometimes it'll still increase a bit. Depends on your setup and what restrictions you have and other yeah. stuff and internal aeration and blah blah blah. But you, you have the simple curve of these points on X Y. And so as you go ahead and take an entire logged track session, where I'm going to take all this data and plot it on my X Y curve of the engine. Is that this engine speed, right? Yep. So it's said engine speeds here. The, all the log data from the entire run, say a 20 minute session. And then you're gonna have the oil at that same point. So you're gonna say, all right, well, oil at 4,000 RPM was, you know, 40 PSI. Cool, that's there. Oh, at this corner, we were also at 4,000, but it was only 30 PSI. Oh, I've got a top way beneath this trend that I had, this nice curve. And so yeah. I have a few points that have fallen out. You know, you're getting starvation or 
to an extent, a heavy amount of aeration because air compresses, right? So when you're going yep. through aeration, you'll start seeing that obviously you're going to have a pressure drop off because air is compressible, the oil is not. So part of your volume is now compressible. So the pressure drops, you push right. it out of the, push it out of the pump and then that air expands back out, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's not that it expands there, but it expands for down line, but right. does it right. still pressurize on the whole system? But um, right. the other thing you'll then see is in cases of aeration, you have very, very telltale signs on the bearing when you read them. You can tell when you have aeration. It almost looks like cavitation on the bearing. So if you like, had like a case pitting? like this, yeah, almost like a round little pitting, like, like yep. little, little, little pox yep. on the bearing face, you'll see. And so if you have aeration, you can do a teardown and see you have aeration. So this kind of thing, if you knew you had bearing wear, you had some starvation, you tear the engine down, you know if you have aeration. If you have starvation, you're just straight up, you know, wiping bearing just face. wiping stuff, yeah. There, there's no oil you know, pickups in the air for, you know, a fraction of a second yeah. like you you'll know because now there's a big slug of air that's going to push, push through right and it'll probably be through like one or two bearings yeah. as you think about it when you get an air pocket the air leaves through that bearing surface that bearing journal right much quicker than the oil does mm-hmm. so it'll leak out and you'll have one rod bearing that got you know a shot of air put through it and it wiped really hard and you'll be able to see yeah. that the problem is most people don't want to tear down and inspect often enough to learn what was going on and what was right. really happening Right. Or, or early enough to catch the beginning signs of the failure. It's just at right. the end when everything the, is destroyed. And when you got 10,000 pieces and what came first, chicken or egg, who knows? Yep, it's, yep. Yeah. Or it's like exactly. called diagnosis murder. You try and figure out who did <laughs> yep. that. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very cool. Well, and so, and, and, and I guess, again, just the scatter plot, you, you, it lets you evaluate a big chunk of data. You can actually right. look at, here's what happened to your oil yeah. pressure. For a twenty-minute track session, you're you're yeah, you're not sitting one... there scrolling through your data, right, and going. Right. Oh, I'm trying to remember what I had at four thousand before. What yeah. was I at there? I don't remember. Yeah, right. And you, you just can grab see it the... all, export it, toss it in a spreadsheet, and make a graph. And you can see you can see the variances. You can yep. see where, like, if it's if you just have like one really tight grouping, okay. Yep. But yeah, we see the, the differences. Okay, okay. Yep. Now there's something going on here. How bad is it? How many points yep. are you seeing it on these off this line? Yeah, yeah. and I say export it to Excel just because it's easy to save numerous track days, put tabs, Sure. here's track days, this, that, and the other. And you can look throughout the year and see what your pressure is looking like. Oh, guess what? On the same spreadsheet, you can also put, you know, crankcase pressures and see what that looked mm-hmm. like and keep trends and be like, you know what? My plot from this and that, they look kind of funny. Let me overlay them. Your yellows and your blues. And I can see what beginning and end of the season look like. And go, oh yeah, my crankcase yeah. pressure is way, you know, up on the average. Hold on. Something's probably right. going on there. Yeah. Right. So Man, I think, yeah, the, the data, that data is just the key. And it's just, we, we've yeah. got to start preaching that more. Yeah. I think get, get a lot of people into to collecting more of that. And with how cheap data acquisition systems are now, like I, I think for people, not just because it makes them a better driver and they look at data and see actually what they had recording Gs and what brake pressures they had. And it's, it's funny. You'll see even professional drivers who think that they're flat out on the throttle and they actually weren't. And you realize, Oh, I wasn't on, I was kind of hesitant for it. I think I was, I think I scared myself, you know, that sort <laughs> right. of thing, right? Right. Yeah. And you think you're actually yep. flat and you weren't flat. And, you know, you thought you were quick on the brakes, but you're actually a little bit slower in your switch between off gas and on brake. And, you know, even just driver input stuff, mm-hmm. the amount of things you can get out of data beyond just keeping your engine healthy and keeping things happy. Yeah. Um, now, the other part of engine life that's not covered by any of this is fatigue. Um, so mm. even if you have an engine that you've been running for years and it's been great and you kept up on it and you've done two or three R&Rs on it, for instance, it's like, you know, a couple of rebuilds. Um, not a big power thing by any means. Just, you know, I had a, you know, forged piston rod build put together and run it 400 wheel horsepower on the, you know, that, that's peak power yeah. on your, your, your track toy, right? You're not out there trying to kill anybody. You're just having fun. You know, you're not trying to make records and make a name for yourself. You're just having to enjoy your car. Yeah. You might want to look at after a couple of r you know, your, your crank you might be fatiguing out. Uh, I, I do recommend people doing when they're going to rebuild, go ahead and have everything checked for cracks. Mm. Um, be it dye, you know, fluorescent dye or, you know, mag checks or take your pick, um, mm-hmm. machine shop that you have someone locally, even if it's not a machine shop, you know, engineering firm, inspection firms, they'll probably have the stuff you can, you can find people to do it. Um, just because you know, so if you have a crack and if you have a crack, it's, it's too late. Yeah. yeah. If you have if a crack, it's, it's definitely done. You got lucky being, if you found the crack. Right. Right. If it's yeah. being used, if it's being stressed, if it's yeah. going through heat cycles, fatigue happens. Yeah. Like now, is... now the other side of this is even beyond that is fatigue. You can have no cracks. You can have nothing showing up and you're just running. It's and then one day it just grenades. Here you go. What's happening? I was literally just driving down the interstate at 3000 RPM, you know, doing 80 miles an hour in six gear, yeah. just cruising light load. And all of a sudden I chucked a rod off the block. What, what these stupid engines, it's, it's a piece of, you know, insert yeah. expletive here. Yeah. Well, I... 
all those times you're doing 700 horsepower pulls before you fatigue the rod and it only yeah. does so many cycles before it's going to go ahead and give yep. up the ghost. That's where, where we're most familiar with that. I think most of us in the super world is, is with transmissions because every yeah, transmission. Speed. Yeah. We know, we know that every transmission, it always fails. When you go to the grocery store, you pick up a pint of ice cream, you're leaving the, you're leaving the grocery store is, is a very normal civilized person. And that's when the gear lets go. Yep. But but it was all those launches and everything else that you did. That was where the fatigue I put into the gear. It just yeah. happened that that extra pint of ice cream. That's what actually <laughs> took it out. So note to self: yeah. don't buy a pint of ice cream, and your five speed will live much. That's longer. right. That's right. Uh, or, or eat the ice cream. Your six speed is bulletproof, though. Anybody who has a six speed that really beats them knows that they're not indestructible too. No. Usually well, fourth gear is fourth gear is what usually goes first. But yeah. and what's interesting there is it's it's also down. I think to a large extent fatigue now because there's so many old six speeds so many people mm -hmm. are going for the 02 304 six speeds that are like 15 years old and older yeah. there's a lot of age there there's a lot of heat cycles yep. there there's a lot of fatigue there and so that the, these used six speeds are not it's not the same as a brand new one that got put in in terms right. of just age and life yeah you, you mentioned the pistons annealing uh, because they got hot so, temperature yeah temperature so i mean how much for a race car, like probably for a street car, they're not getting used, not getting hot enough to really have like the temperature have a really detrimental effect quickly. But if you start making maybe, I don't know, 500 horsepower or more, like would even just the heat load, just the simple heat load because of the power that you're making, would that be something that starts to factor in here to, to component yeah. life? So if you compare aluminum and steel, um, if you look up what's called an SN curve, um, Essentially, it's kind of the curve that you use to look at the given material's fatigue life and how many cycles, go, you know, X scales and log and how many, you know, 10 to the what number of cycles you can do with things. Um, and then also the other part is, you know, the strain you're putting on it. And, and you can see with, with the given strain of what you're going to put on, of course, the bigger the strain, then, you know, this it's basically a line that's intercepting. The more strain, the shorter the cycle, the less strain, the further out, you know, the more cycles I can get out of it. Yeah. And as you start doing these things, particularly start getting these massive low points of detrimental damage, there are just high amounts of strain in the part, uh, more so than say, for instance, someone thought it was ever going to have, you, you start kind of, it's a ticking time bomb. It, mm. it really is. You, you start putting more and more power. Yeah. You know, uh, we'll use uh, the new RA block, for instance. Let's mm -hmm. cause some drama here, right? So the okay. RA block, okay. yeah, it's just a great option to go to. And yeah, someone might have made 550, 600 wheel horsepower, whatever, out of it. Someone did that on the old EJ255 when the 06 WX first came out as well. No one looks at those and says it's, you know, the best block you can get. It'll last forever. No, everybody knows those are still cracking lances. It's, right. it's not massively improved. There are other things that have changed in it aside from just piston. Um, but yeah, it, it's not that it's some savior. Yeah, it can make 600 wheel horsepower and it can do it. Uh, one I think of is... Uh, there have been a, a couple of show cars, uh, a rather infamous one that was kind of burnt orange color uh, hmm. years back. It was a GD STI that was on the Manly H-beams, the skinny little H-beams. Yeah. And of course, it's a show car. It was a Dino Queen. I think they said it made 550 wheel horsepower. And I point blank said I would not tell anyone who's a race person to put the Manly H-beams in. Because the original Manly H-beams, these tiny little twig things. Right. Like, I don't think Manly ever expected Super Guys to come out and start making big cylinder pressure. I also right. don't think Manly thought about the bore size on a Subaru when they're making that pressure. You know, connecting right. rod does not have an easy task. Um, so, you know, it, thankfully they, they've got, you know, their, their, uh, I can't remember, their H, their, their H tufts or whatever they call them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, which has got more material on the, on the bottom end. Yeah. Yeah. Just took a lot of guys, you know, sending manly beams through their blocks to, you know, finally get that moving along. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah. I, almost honestly, like technology has come a long way too. I mean, kind of like what we, what we were talking about earlier as far as like maybe standalones data um mm -hmm. tuners have learned a lot like fueling has gotten way better there you know there's a lot of newer better tools and, and pieces to use right, right now than 10 cool. or 15 even 20 years ago and, and even for guys like me and performance aftermarket guys our tools have gotten better and more affordable you know what we have for cfd or fea assuming you know how to do it in boundary conditions, a realistic sort of thing, you can actually yeah. give a really good product compared to you couldn't buy a seat of CFD, you know, 20 years right. ago. You, right. You're going to, you're going to go to 60 grand to buy a seat and have, you know, 20 grand a year on your subscription to keep your ANSYS running. Like I can't afford that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And so most people couldn't. So that the development yeah. that 
the the quality of parts yeah. was not the same as what it is now. Yeah. So to so a certain extent, maybe why some people are able to do what they can do on RA blocks is because better fueling, better tuning, better better tools. Not control to, to get it. Yeah, not control and people being aware that not control is a thing. Yep. Um, yeah, and, I'll say and injectors I think have a lot to do with it. Yeah, way so better. Just injector injectors. balancing their flows, everything. Yeah, you, you can get Man. good injectors now. Like how it's, it's it would be an interesting to throw back and say, all right, you can you can use a, a stock ECU, stock side feed injectors. You can cut off the pintle caps till the cows come home, no problem there. <laughs> but all you can use is this Apple IIe to tune it. All right, let's see how much power you can make and well, how reliable it'll be. Even cutting off the pintle cap, though, you're giving yourself all kinds of problems because now your spray's gone to crap. So fuel distribution's terrible. One cylinder's going to fire up stronger than the other. And then well, even sure. just the base of your four injectors are going to behave differently because you're going to flow them and all of a sudden realize that you've got like a 20% discrepancy on fuel flow on the same injectors. Well, well but Michael, yeah. we know that now. We didn't know that then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was, so. I mean, I remember that like there was this oh, yeah. little window of time where like, oh, that's all you do. You just cut the pintle cap off. Don't, don't send your injectors out to get like new pencil caps welded on just cut them off you don't need those things yeah. like what's the guy who did that was it witch hunter who's the one who did the uh weld of the new ones on well old nasiak name i think it was witch hunter or something like that maybe and did and deach works then came along yeah. and they were like the big one he started doing the regular yeah. like sending they, they, had, a, they had a ones. process for it yeah. yeah and then i knew yeah. their performance shop so it would take batches of stock injectors and cut them off and send them out and kind of batch we'll them themselves based on yep. flow numbers but yeah that's it one operating zone at one pressure that they're the right. same not yet. right so things are way better now arcade. than they once were. That is, that is they a factor. Sure. That is definitely yeah. a factor. Well, I, I just looked at the time and, and we have run over. So Micah, oh, I apologize nice. and thank you. But before we wrap, just because uh, you'd want to talk about trickle down a little bit. Have we, have we touched on that or is there some other aspects of um, how like kind of modern engine design might be coming to. I mean, there, uh, there's a little bit, you know, we kind of talked about combustion systems and how things work. Um, yeah. I don't think it's any surprise that for instance, like you look at the new AMG, uh, they're they're two liter. The eighty one Mobor that they have four cylinder. Yeah. Uh, uh, A forty three. What do no. they call it? I can't remember. A, A whatever AMG. Yeah. It's the four cylinder two liter that makes like four hundred seventy five horsepower. Yeah. Meets Which emissions is... stuff. Yeah. Four hundred seventy five horsepower emissions compliant. Also has an electric assisted turbo, so that when you have all that low end and you need torque and torque fill, and also as a tool for you know emissions, if you need to have yeah. cylinder pressure at low speed to hit a load point or something. You have it there. Um, you know, that's example. It, it is coming along. These things are coming down. And even if you're not seeing pre-chamber ignition systems in production cars, I know there's one Alpha that does it. Uh, I think wow. it's Alpha Romeo that does it. But anyway, someone's using huh. one, and it's the okay. model based system. But um, okay. yeah, well, dude, it, it is coming. How, how much of a game changer is that electronic, elect, electronically, I don't know, what you, what you call it, augmented yeah. turbo? No, I'll say, I'll, 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 We'll say electronically assisted. Electronically so electrically assisted. assisted. Turbo. Yeah. Yeah. Electrically is, assisted turbo. Is that a huge game changer? Do oh, you they're think? awesome. Yeah. Okay. They're really cool. Uh, I'm I'm working on one right now for myself. So that sounds a poor awesome. man's version. It'll be you a fun what? project and how cheaply I can do F1 technology. But, okay. It's not exactly that, but I have. Do you have any opinion or, or knowledge of what Subaru is doing with the electronic uh, wastegate and bypass valve on the new WRX? As you mean, how it's just are, an electric are they, gate? In the bypass are they? Are I've I've heard that they're playing with it. I've heard that like what when I was talking to Harvey about it when he he was looking at the data, uh, sorry, the duty cycles on the dyno. Mm -hmm. It's like they're keeping the wastegate open until open. you actually get like yeah, a low past, well yeah. past half throttle, and then they're closing it to build boost versus yeah. so you get more efficiency naturally aspirated. So into guys were doing that boost. with the uh, the BMW N fifty fours, the three thirty five engine. Yes, yeah. we're doing that with that, and because they're a vacuum-based system, if I recall. Um, but yeah, yes. they're driving around gates open. I mean, it's a it's a total tool you can use, and it's great that uh, electronic wastegate actuators are awesome. The, the, okay. For for what you and I can get, uh, this isn't like an F1 car where it's hydraulic. Yes, right. it's hydraulic wastegates in an F1 car, but you know, oh. it's an electronic wastegate. Well, they're fast. Hydraulics are very very fast. For sure. A very small line. Um, <laughs> right. So. Electronic stuff's fantastic. You basically punch in a number that you want to do, and it goes boom. All right, got it. I'm there. Oh, moving further. All right, cool. You just need to have an H bridge controller to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. It it's essentially well, it's, a stepper motor. Well, it's it's like this area of control that I I mean I guess maybe some people played around with it a little bit, but you know generally it's 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 uh, analog. You know it's just 
based on vacuum yeah. pressure and you can kind of control it a little bit, but you don't really, you can't make it do whatever you want whenever you want. And right. it now, now Super is, is playing around with that a little bit and it sounds interesting. I would, I'm curious one of the things I haven't seen, you know, not being on the OEM side, I'm curious what they're using the electronic, uh, I'll say, you know, bypass valve for mm -hmm. um, the, ele the electric actuator. And I'm wondering if they're actually partially using it to clip surge points in certain areas. Um, that is, so for those that aren't familiar with turbos, if you look at a compressor map, um, so you kind of have this blob, blob looking yep. thing, right? Again, your X and Y, so I'm doing it so you kind of make sense. Yep. Um, or am I actually mirrored? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. so you, yeah, you got your X, Y. Yep. And so as it's coming up, so you've got your, your islands of efficiency. And so this top edge here that comes up, the very top edge is your surge line. Um, okay. Essentially, that's where you start trying to make too much pressure for the given mass flow rate. And so you start having an instability within the wheel itself. Is that a compressor mm -hmm. wheel around here somewhere? I'm like, oh yeah, I got a little itty bitty one. So yeah, itty bitty tiny compressor wheel. But yeah, so mm -hmm. as you're, you know, taking the air in, it's trying to go in and it's trying to push out. So this is where you end up having the volume, your snail, if you will. Yep. Um, so compressor housing, what happens is it's trying to push it and it can't push it anywhere. You end up having the stability, instability. And that's where right. you start getting that choo choo that, that right. uh, what do the people call a stew 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 or whatever, however they type it. Yep. Yeah, so you start getting surge, the choo 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 sounds yep. and uh, not good. And you can get that even just coming onto load. Now, the thing is, if you go ahead right. and open your bypass, you drop your pressure ratio, right? So you alleviate that so you don't hit it. And I'm wondering if they're yeah. doing that for high altitude stuff. It's something we'd actually hit with trucks when I was doing performance emissions work at Volvo okay. Powertrain. High altitude. So people out in Colorado, mm -hmm. trash trucks would go out there and start pegging wheel speed sensor limits and things like that. And, of course, opening it for that would just make wheel speed increase. But right. I don't know if maybe they're hitting load points earlier or my my thought really was more like you take someone with an, an ascent where they're towing, put five thousand pounds behind it, five thousand pounds yeah. pounds behind it, and mat it, and all of a sudden they get all kinds of additional load that they have on it that might go ahead and would otherwise add additional load. Yeah. And well, especially with the them. with the new WRX, I I don't know about the ascent's base boost pressure, but the new WRX it's like ten to twelve psi, so they're they're, they're running actually a bigger Garrett turbo but at much lower pressure. And then you have the two electronic controls for both ends. Yeah. And, and they've got are... one sitting downstairs. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I bought one of the, uh, NHTSA wrecked, uh, ascent engines back in 2019. So okay. Yeah. Okay. And they're, um, it needs a home, but yeah, it's sitting there for now. It's yeah. Super is, I mean, the technology, it is starting to come down there. And I, I mean, it seems like Subaru is, they're they're making some progress. I mean, with efficiency and what this what this little engine can do, it, yeah, it's kind of cool. I it hope is. they keep going. I hope they they push yeah. a little bit further. And well, part of the thing that also gets me is uh, talking about the EJs. I'll try and wrap this real quick. Is is we didn't get to the FAs, and so the oh, FA yeah. and FB engines. You also yeah. look at them. Subaru still was confined. Mm -hmm. They still wanted to have a symmetric all-wheel drive setup, and the FBs and FAs, if you call, fit in the same chassis as the EJs because. They had the crossovers. It could be an yeah. like a Forester, got the FB25, yeah. or you could still have an EJ Turbo in it. Right. And and so you kind of had that crossover years where so they made a new engine that was trying to be a better emissions engine, you know, more stroke, smaller bore, you know, try and reduce that bore diameter, try and keep better control, get a more tumble on it. You can look at the port geometry, it started changing, started putting all these things in that play to that effect. Um, but they're still constrained from the outside in because they chose we're in this chassis, and so we have to put something in here. Man, it. Do you think that they're going to have to let go of the boxer engine at some point? Because, like, if they had an, if they, if they would let go of the boxer and go to an inline, which is very un Subaru, I know. But like, you get uh, rid of those constraints, and all of a sudden, like, you, it would, it would like open up a world of possibilities. And like, in terms of like this whole oil starvation thing, yeah. well, now you don't have heads on the side. It's well, they could run a V four. Yeah, that'd knowing, be fun. Knowing them, run a like, hot V V four. Yeah, it'd be like 175 degree V four or something like that. Because no, you can you just make it you know like a 90 degree V four. It's not a problem. Sure. Then it's still symmetrical all wheel drive. Man, you'd have all sorts of room. You'd have much yeah. better oil draining. Yeah. I sh we should we should write them a letter. I, maybe they just maybe they <laughs> well, just say, haven't thought for, of this. For those yet. who are curious, uh, probably one of the most notable recent uh, V fours would be Porsche's LMP one engine. It's a cool little two liter. Oh yeah, the. Yeah. Was that the nine? Was it nine thirteen? The nine sixteen and nine sixteen, I think, or nine seventeen. Nine nineteen. This is, this is all, no the nine eighteen. The hypercar. Right? I can't. Yeah, the hyper. Yeah. Yeah. LMP one H. Yeah. Hybrid. Yeah. So that was a. I didn't realize it was a four cylinder V. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. 
See, they, they like to do what Porsche does. So we'll just we'll write that. We'll give them a suggestion. And by <laughs> the way, next one. Just, Porsche just, had yeah, you did good, boxers, now do V's. Yeah. Yeah, they had a good amount of success yeah. in Le Mans. You should look that up. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Right Brilliant. On. Well, Micah, I should let you go. Thank you so much for your time as always. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, if you got any more questions, post them below. Uh, Micah might have to pick your brain on some more things. Maybe we need to maybe we need to actually focus just on the new was it the, the FA20, FA24 turbos? Just try and figure out what's, what's going on with those at some point. If that's the case, I'll dissect mine and bring more show and tell. So, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thanks again so much for the time, Micah. Yeah. Take care. We'll talk yeah. again soon. Pleasure talking again, John. Thanks, Bye. sir. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. Once again, we'd like to let you know that your support is what makes this show possible. Be sure to check out our online store at flatironstuning.com for any of your aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts needs. And as always, stay tuned with Flatiron's Tuning.